Today's guest is Ben Sparks. Ben's a teacher, a public speaker, a math popularizer. In fact, as you'll find out today, he's a man who wears many hats. And not all of them are great fashion choices. Hopefully, you might already know Ben from his number file videos, which are always favourites with our viewers. They include amazing explanations of the Mandelbrot set, and an explanation of why the golden ratio is so irrational. But this interview starts with a topic I always find personally fascinating. Ben, really often I ask people about like their childhood and their really early days. I'm really excited to ask you about this because if memory serves correctly, you are a twin. <laughs> I am a twin. I'm fascinated by twinness. <laughs> So am I, but then that's personal sort of experience or victimization, perhaps. What's that like being a twin? It's normal. I mean, obviously, this, this is the question everybody asks when they find something unusual, right? Particularly maybe twins, but the yeah. it's completely normal for me. I, I don't know any other way. So it's very difficult for me to compare uh, some sort of normal existence where I don't have someone who's genetically identical to me. But, it, it you know, there are pros and cons, like many arrangements in this life. Yeah, it's an identical twin, is it? Identical twin, not fraternal. What's the opposite? Monozygotic. Is that the technical word? That, one egg. Oh, okay. One egg which splits, which is the opposite of if a twin... Twins could come out if there were two eggs happen to be lurking around and they both get fertilised. Yeah. And that's just like siblings. That's non-identical twins. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure they spare, share a special bond, but it's nothing like the annoyance that I can create to my twin brother. <laughs> Uh, and vice versa. So yeah, we are the, genetically exactly the same. One sperm, one egg turned into two people. He's called Tim. And it, it, if people want to go and find him online, he's doing some awesome bits of music. So uh, that's always fun to go and... All right. We'll link to whatever we need to so people can go and go and check him out. How did you know I was a twin, Brady? I'm sure you've just told me in conversation. I'm, sh I'm sure you've told me multiple times it's come up. Just, you know. Clearly I'm bragging about it. Well, no, I think it's just, I think it's just come up. Were you close? Like, were you, are you like, you know, are you like, be absolute best buds or because you know s some siblings are really close some yeah. siblings are just you know acquaintances are you guys like you know best buds i think we are closer than most brothers and sisters but we're also mm. more annoyed by each other than most brothers and sisters and and you know brothers and sisters can annoy each other by default but we're, so we're really close in that we are very similar but we mm. he lives up north and i live down south so we don't see a lot of each other but we we quite often hang out online but we don't actually chat about life a lot we often just play games i think we have both been surprised how similar we end up particularly when we are separated because we don't have the reaction response hmm. when we're in the same place we we tend to react off each other and diverge because we see what the other person is yeah. doing but when we're apart right. we just settle into our normal uh, genetic material and it turns out that's identical so what's an example of that what's like if you haven't seen him for a while what's and you catch up what's something that will make you guys go oh Oops. If we've both read a book recently, it will quite often end up, you know, picking the same films or books just because we have the same interests from growing up. And we'll end up talking about that and realizing we've done exactly the same sort of process uh, about reading books in some order. Yeah. But then I think the, the most obvious effect is that within within a few minutes, we have the potential to get seriously grumpy with each other because we. So I see Tim uh, basically being a bit of an ass, you know, <laughs> stop, stop. Yeah. and he's being really annoying. And then I suddenly have this realization, this bombshell of like, Ah, that's exactly what I do. Yeah. And so you have this horrible mirror. You know, it, it's a very sobering thing. It's probably a good thing, but it is yeah. suddenly like, ah, oh, he's being annoying and I'm annoyed by it, but that's exactly what I do. I mean, a lot of people get that from their parents, don't they? Like, yeah. oh my goodness, I'm turning into my mum or dad, but you've got someone who's your exact same age. Yeah, and... I get it from my parents too, but uh, but Tim and I both both experience that and we'll tend to oscillate and then one person will be super grumpy and the other one's all carefree and just being, being themselves and then, uh, and then it'll switch. Depending on who's drunk the most beer first, probably. <laughs> Do you look alike? Yeah, uh, a lot of people judge if they want to go and find photos. I, uh, he's a little bit, you know, slimmer and more handsome than I am. Um... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, actually, at school, it was fun. We weren't in the same class, but we obviously had overlapping friends. Yeah. But the nicknames were basically Tim's friends would see me coming down the, the corridor and say, like, "Oh, look, it's, it's Tim, but he's smiling." So I got the, the nickname Happy Tim. Because he just had this reputation for being a grumpy sword all the time. I don't quite know. Oh, okay. But I was Tim, but smiling, so I was happy Tim for a long time. You're the, you're the happier of the two. I don't think it's true, but certainly that's you know how these 
these stereotypes start somehow and then exist as a joke for a long time. I'm not going to be able to continue podcasting until I see a picture. So hang on, let me have a look. Where do I find him? What's his website or something? Or There's an American guitar player who Tim yeah. is very frustrated about because he's brilliant uh, and it's not my brother. There's also and he's a, the a, one I'm getting lots of pictures of. Well, there's also a, a water engineer and he did a, a degree in sort of environmental engineering. So Tim's been overlapped by two other Tim Sparks. I found the video, your own idea. He's wearing a ridiculous oh, hat. Yeah. He's a ridiculous hat. <laughs> That's a bit weird. <laughs> it's not he me. It's just like you. Yeah, the whole... Unless that is you. You're not in the video, are you? Not to my knowledge. But, you know, I, I look at it and can't tell, you know. <laughs> oh, wow, There's a giveaway that's, that's, in that he's playing amazing. guitar quite well. <laughs> he's a much better musician in terms of practice. Oh, Ben, you freaked me out. I've got another friend who's an identical twin, and the first time I saw his twin, I was like, it really weirded me out. And this happened again. <laughs> I, th- I think it's one of those things, the first glimpse of a twin, and we do look similar, hmm. um, the first glimpse is weird, and then within 10 minutes you'd have, you'll be noticing, what, how could I have even confused these two, particularly uh, visually, and our mannerisms will be the same, and our voices will almost certainly be ide- more identical than you expect, but after 10 minutes yeah. of like just hanging out... You realise he's an arse and I'm not, and that's... <laughs> yeah, you're, you're happy. You're yeah. happy, Tim. Happy, happy Tim. Ben. Well, anyway, this has been a great... It's been great on the podcast to find out about Tim Sparks. We'll be back next week <laughs> with... <laughs> Let's talk about you, but I may have occasionally ask you a Tim question, seeing you've got this parallel. You're welcome parallel to do so. life going on. Were you good at mathematics when you were little? At school, I think I was good or rather I found it straightforward it wasn't that it was a passion of mine I think in general I I felt like I was I did good at school and maybe got called a nerd and a swat and maybe that's not a surprise if anybody knows me now but Mm. math wasn't a huge passion that did change eventually Um, yeah but would you have been like top of the class would would have would have been you know of Ben always gets the highest mark on the math test I would have been up there I don't remember it being quite so clear-cut as that but certainly, I think I got disappointed if I did badly in maths. I, like it was in my head that I should be able to do this. So, as you were, as you in those sort of you know early years of school, primary school through high school, what did you want to be? What was your like? You know, if someone said, "Oh, hello, little Ben, what do you want to be when you grow up?" What would what would that Ben likely have told me? That's a very good question. I really should have expected that. Um, <laughs> listening to some podcasts from Number Five, but. Yeah. It's not obvious to me looking back. Aside from being a kid and wanting to be a fireman or something, mainly because they drove red trucks. I'm sure that was part of my very small imaginings. But then I think I enjoyed messing around with computers. I was no particular sort of early comp- programming prodigy or anything like that. But I think yeah. possibly thinking about going that direction. Yeah. But then I also enjoyed like the more sort of social aspects and music and stuff. And so I, it wasn't a clear career path in my head. I wasn't like, I'm going to be... A musician that never really crossed my mind I also wasn't good enough or at least it yeah. felt, felt like that as music but then I think I wanted to would do something with computers and mathematics so as a musician what were you what band I know you play guitar now is that what you were playing then or what what did you play actually I was probably singing more that, that may you, we've come back to twin stuff without you yeah. even asking but yeah. it's inevitable what talking about my growing up so Tim studied A-level music. He didn't do GCSE music, but my brother did A-level music and sort of caught up on that. And I did the maths, further maths, physics, chemistry thing at A-level. Yeah. Really predictable. I'm kind of jealous now because he learned a lot about just other stuff, partic- music in particular, doing that. Mm. And uh, as a result, he played guitar and he played the trumpet. I played the violin a bit, but it was I just didn't put enough practice in. And that is the main problem. Thinking you're not good at stuff is usually equivalent to not doing enough time with it yeah. but i sang and i used to sing in choirs and stuff and i didn't particularly enjoy the choral stuff and it really took off when tim started realizing he could play stuff on the guitar that we all knew and i could sing it and we could sing together and actually that was one of the biggest things of having a twin is that singing with your twin is like having a multi-tracker on, on demand right you, the harmonies and stuff like they, they blend very easily oh, and, yeah. and that's still really fun i love singing with my brother so it was it was singing for me music but then I learned the guitar when we both went off to uni and suddenly my accompanist <laughs> and harmonizer had gone off to Cardiff. Yeah. So, so I had to learn the, learn some chords on the guitar. What was your, what was like the go-to song for you guys? Did you have like a party trick song? Like, like everyone has a karaoke song. What would, what would, oh, what yeah. would Tim and happy Tim sing if they were like, if everyone was like, come on, sing us a song guys. There would have been quite a lot by the time we got to 18, but I think mm. I remember maybe it was a karaoke thing at like the local, the local, the yokel is probably about right. <laughs> the local, the local youth group drop-in regularly had like Friday night drop-ins, and occasionally would do karaoke things. Yeah. 
And I think we got up and sang together as a horrifying twin double act. Do you remember um, They Might Be Giants? I mean, they're still going, right? Yeah. The song Istanbul, not Constantinople. Okay. They also did Birdhouse in Your Soul, which is a, a lot more famous. But we did a little double act to Istanbul. It was Constantinople. Now it's Istanbul, not Constantinople. I'm not okay. going to sing anymore. Okay. Uh, and it probably looked like some horrible cabaret mess. <laughs> but <laughs> I think learning that we could sing together and it was fun and people liked it. That definitely for both of us is a, is a big energizer. This I, slightly egotistical performance thing is is running through both of our psyches. At what point then in high school did it become apparent you were going down this mathematics track? I did GCSE maths because you have to, right? And I did well. And I think I was in a class of people that were doing well. And it wasn't particularly unusual that a whole bunch of us did well. But it was then choosing A-levels. And I remember having a conversation with my maths teacher saying... Maybe I could do maths and further maths because I quite like maths. And I remember them saying, nah, don't bother. No, no one needs really further maths unless you want to go and be an academic mathematician. And I, actually, now I say it, I clearly didn't want to go that way because that put me off. Right. And I tried to do computer science instead. And then there was some weird option mess up and I couldn't do computer science or they weren't offering it that year. And I defaulted back to doing further maths, the second A-level in mathematics in, in the UK. Okay. And that is when I started to realise, oh, there's... It's not just calculation. It's not just arithmetic. There's not. It's not just occasional easiness with an occasional smile. It's actually there's sort of mysteries of the universe, and you start to get a glimpse into them. Yeah. It, things like complex numbers first turned up at that level at school, and I I loved it. What did you do at university then? What did you choose? Did you do mathematics? Just straight mathematics at uni? I did straight mathematics at uni, and I, in hindsight think i did it for the wrong reasons in that I, I chose the one the subject i was finding easiest i was probably always going to go that direction yeah but i don't think i really understood what the subject was about and when it got hard at uni and it did get hard and it got very abstract i didn't enjoy it as much so the honest judgment of my degree was that i didn't have a good time doing the subject where did you go i went to oxford yeah i, I very nearly didn't it didn't really fit my image of my own stereotype to go to oxford to study and I had an offer from Bristol to do mathematical engineering, which actually even now sounds like an amazingly interesting course full of artificial intelligence mathematics stuff. Yeah. But you get an offer from Oxford, it is difficult to turn it down. Yeah. Um, and I didn't. And I'm very glad I went to Oxford. I had a great time there, but it has its issues. And and it's hard, right? So, and I, I found the maths more difficult than I was expecting. And this is really normal, I now know as a, as a teacher, to see the transition from school to uni and like flip this is difficult how did you find the whole from being probably i imagine a, a, you know a, a big fish in a small pond to being you know just a guy doing maths at oxford with all the best people in the country there yeah it's sobering it's it's yeah. not pleasant but it's also it wasn't the end of the world and what it, i think it made me do was treat my degree rightly or wrongly as not the priority of my time at university i wouldn't be the first to have done this i'm sure but I spent a lot of time doing other things. So I, I joined an a cappella group, or I helped start an a cappella group at Oxford, an all male a cappella choir, and we were singing pop and rock stuff. And I was going to say, was this the 1950s? <laughs> like... It was in America, college a cappella is absolutely huge. It's like the equivalent of the first f football team. It's like you can join the college okay. a cappella group. And there was an American guy doing a graduate program called Derek Smith, and he started this group called Out of the Blue. And there wasn't an all male fun choir it wasn't like oxford's full of choirs full of, full of choirs singing choral yeah. stuff and this was fun we were singing red hot chili peppers with 14 guys unaccompanied and people oh, yeah. go crazy <laughs> because it was kind of new in the uk there weren't yeah. there aren't many a cappella groups there's still not as many as as america but it just it just took off, and we went around the world several times. I sang for Bill Clinton and things. It was, oh. it... I, it ended up being that that was what I spent a lot of my time focusing on during uni it was music, socialising. I was really into the church group I was part of as well. So there was a lot of other things competing for my maths time. Yeah, and I remember my tutor uh, asking me, like, you know. Is, is maths your priority at the moment? And I was like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> and he he brought this up at the end of the course after we'd all finished and I, you know, passed. Mm. He was like, I remember you telling me maths wasn't really your priority at the moment. And uh, he told me how horrified he was. And then I think he appreciated by the end that there was no point in pretending. Yeah. But we both, he, yeah, he 
he made he prevailed on me to do some math sometime and i managed to do it alongside some music and that was good it just sounds like you had a good work-life balance to me i think that uh, the nature of, or the, the notion of a good work-life balance does not exist in oxford right so it was very imbalanced in that everything was mental you get eight weeks to be at uni and then you're off like that's a term so you're at uni for less than half the year paying your fees <laughs> Yeah. And everything is crammed into those crazy eight weeks. It's a very strange environment. As four lots of eight weeks. Three lots of eight weeks. Three lots of eight weeks. Yeah, the three terms. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's crazy. That's not a lot of time. And and all your studies and sort of extracurricular studies are happening in that time. And then you sort of go home. And I had to go back to my parents' house in Dorset. And that's fine. But everyone else was still at uni. All my mates had gone off to other places. My brother was at Cardiff. And they, they wouldn't come home at all because they had rented you know a proper flat and i was living in some crazy 14th century college room that they rent out to conferences so i had to come home huh. oxford's messed up but sometimes in a good way just quickly bill clinton his daughter was at oxford at the same time as me yeah so <laughs> this is chelsea yeah chelsea was uh, i think she was at new college or at least she had yeah. uh, there was there was a connection with one of the guys in the group who was an american uh Rhodes Scholar, I think. Yeah. And uh, I remember one rehearsal for Out of the Blue, Wes, who was this guy, he had, he had sort of secondhand connection with Chelsea. Um, yeah. He turned up late to rehearsal. And that was really, like, it was almost run militarily. It's like, you don't turn up late or you get a face full of uh, oh, oh, president of the group. So Wes turned up late and on his phone. Yeah. And then he got off the phone. Everyone was expecting him to get uh, yelled at. And he was about to. And then he's like, no, just listen. They're coming. And we're like, who's coming? They're coming. And it turns out... Um, Bill was visiting Chelsea and Chelsea had told Bill about this group, this out of the blue group that we were part of. And uh, he just said, oh, let's just go and see what they're up to. So Wes had arranged for them to come and visit us during rehearsal, like nine o'clock at night. So we all trooped out to this um, place in New College, which is fantastically one of the oldest colleges in Oxford, yeah. into these dark cloisters around the back. And it was all sort of mysterious. And Bill and Chelsea there were there with a bunch of security guards. Yeah. And they said, yeah, sing us a song. So, so we sang him a couple of songs, and he had a quick chat, and then we sang another song, and then shook hands, and we all went back to rehearsal, feeling slightly spaced out. Wow. Realized that realized that no one had taken a photo, so we ran back to, uh, on mass to find him again, and he was just coming out of the college. Yeah. So there is a there's a blurry, grainy photo, which I'll send if you're desperate to see it. Yeah. Of all of us with Bill under some streetlight, and almost none of us are visible because it's really dark. <laughs> it's quite atmospheric. That's awesome. Uh, do you remember what you sang? Probably some cheap barbershop. Yeah. <laughs> we might have done some Chili Peppers. One of the songs that I used to sing the solo on was Other Side by Chili Peppers. We might have done that, although it's a little bit kind of harsh, brutal. Yeah. That's amazing. Like, did you know Chelsea? Did you ever meet her? Or was it? Yeah, really... it was, I spoke to her, but she wouldn't know who I was now. And no. So I didn't know her well. But she yeah. probably thought she was talking to Tim Sparks. Probably, you know, he's yeah. pretty famous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So as you progressed through your years at Oxford. Tell me about how your relationship with mathematics was changing. I was increasingly disillusioned with the pure side of things, which is ironic now, but I'm getting ahead of myself. But the all the abstract proof of like, you know, prove why there's only one zero and does it exist at all? Mm. With genuine questions to deal with in the sort of basis of mathematics weren't exciting me. And I increasingly went more and more applied doing sort of mechanics and physics applications. I did a course on relativity and quantum theory, which was fascinating, yeah. very confusing and difficult. But that was what I really got more into. And I think I was doing the sort of thing that every student does. You, you kind of pick the courses you know you're going to get through rather than ones that you necessarily think are important. Yeah. And so I was getting through it rather than enjoying it. And after my degree, I went into teaching. I, I did a year teaching maths and physics and music and PE in a tiny little private school in Oxfordshire. Okay. With, with no training. Had that been the plan, Ben? Like, to, as you were coming towards the end of university, you, you, there was never thought to, you know, I'm going to become a math professor or I'm going to go and work in the city and make a, you know, work in the share markets and stuff. Was was teacher always the next step or did you kind of just fall into that? Like, in that last year of university, yeah. you must have been thinking, oh my God, what do I do next? Well, the hedge funds are queuing up to recruit mass graduates and all yeah. the consultancies. And and then the other option is teaching. There are infinitely many career choices. I think I only realized that in my third year, everybody's queuing up to get a mass graduate. And that makes it harder sometimes to figure out what you want to do. And I think I'd always had teaching in the back of my mind. What was more clear is I didn't want to go into the city and do finance stuff. Right. You certainly could do. And a lot of people said, I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it for five years, earn my millions or whatever, yeah. and come out. And I... I wasn't ready to do that but someone offered me a job in this tiny private school which you could t i could take without doing any training because it's a private school 
ironically, okay. the schools you pay money to go to are the ones that can have people who are completely unqualified. Right. Uh, Rant aside, I, I did that for a year. Uh, sorry, can you tell me again, what were you teaching there? You were teaching... Maths math? and physics. Yeah. And music. Uh, I, I use the term loosely. Uh, it was more music appreciation. Right. <laughs> and I took, I think I took some CDs of REM in. <laughs> right. <laughs> Force these poor teenagers to listen to 90s rock. Excellent. Uh, uh, and PE. So I taught rugby and football and... I was a grade one qualified rugby coach. Wow. I was awful. I was really bad. You were a proper uh, all-rounder. You were a real polymath there by the sounds of it. Yeah, but then I was teaching in a very small school where you have to wear lots of hats to sort of justify your existence. And yeah. I was also completely untrained trying to figure out how to do a difficult job. I loved the teaching. It's hard work and it was it was just a nice change after studying, I think, to do some sort of social interaction work. And yeah. the, the bits of teaching that feel a bit like a performance, I think that's where I noticed that you know, I, I, that floats my boat, doing something in front of an audience. Yeah. That's not just what teaching is, but there's an aspect of it. And yeah. I liked that. I think that year made me realise I should go and train. I, you know, this is a difficult job. I really need some input. Yeah. So that's what I did. I went and did a PGC the following year. And that for, year... For I, our listeners, I mean, most of our listeners probably aren't British. Can you explain what that means? A PGC is a postgraduate certificate in education. And it's like a one-year teacher training course that you would do after you graduated yeah. from a degree. So you do your subject... Which I think, and it's a good way, you need to know your subject in order to yeah. impart knowledge about it. And then you do a year focusing on uh, pedagogy or the science of teaching and how it fits with your subject. So it's a very yeah. subject specific year, but it's also a teaching specific year. A sort of, this is converting graduates who maybe didn't want to be a teacher into a teacher in, in a sort of a one year condensed course. Yeah, although it's the primary route into ironically secondary education in that most people teaching in a secondary school would do it that route and yep. if you do a full degree in teaching which is possible a b-ed or what they call it yeah you you might take three or four years but um you don't have time to get the subject knowledge that you need perhaps to teach at secondary level so yeah. th th this is the way most teachers in secondary schools would have trained so you so you do this conversion you've converted into a teacher in this one year course where do you go from there then you get a teaching job i think what that year showed me though and I credit my tutors who were amazing, it was that mathematics wasn't what I'd got used to at Oxford, which was just a problem sheet after a problem sheet of difficult questions that I couldn't quite see the point. Because when they're training you to teach, that you know, what works very well is going back to something you think you know about and you think you can tell other people about, i.e. you're a teacher, tell them about factorising equations, and then show them something surprising. And if you suddenly see something surprising, even though it's basic, your motivation to learn something about it just goes through the roof. Yeah. So I think that year made me realize why maths is great that the sort of the playfulness like i wonder what happens if instead of following the rules that other people tell you which is kind of how you pass your exams at school and uni it became well just what happens if this and what are the consequences of trying that and i wonder what happens if you play with it like this it's really interesting ben because so many people i've spoken to have told me this kind of story that at a school they felt like mathematics was just solving problems and like you know brute force yeah and then it was when they got to university this magic door opened and they realized it was not what it was something else it was something more amazing but it sounds like your university experience was almost just more yeah. problem solving and worksheets and tests and things and it wasn't until after university you got this this new insight that turned that switched you i think that's true for me it doesn't mean the door wasn't there for me I just didn't open it at uni. Some yeah. people got that, uh, even alongside me. They were like, I just love this stuff. And they went into academic maths because they wanted to get more of it. And I didn't go through the door, maybe. Your metaphor is that, like, that door is there. And it's even there at school. Mm. But maybe having the teacher to point out, like, that through that door lies playful, adventurous maths. And through this door is, you're going to get an A because you do what you're told. And you can go both directions at once. But I didn't notice the the tinkering aspect of it, the ask your own questions aspect of maths until I trained as a teacher. Mm. And I'm very glad I did because it gave me massive more motivation to do a difficult job of teaching and something which has lasted now, a, a sort of motivation just to play with bits of maths that interest me. Almost invariably, we stumble across, you know, an inspirational teacher or someone along the way. Did your inspirational teacher come when you were learning to be a teacher? Certainly one of them. I mean... Every story about anyone who's successful in some bits of their life will probably credit someone who inspires them. But there were teachers at school who taught me well 
and weren't afraid to show you show me cool things. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Noble, Mister Turner, my A level maths teachers. Yeah. But then I had a really good tutor. At, this is the guy who laughed at me when I said maths wasn't my priority. Dominic Welsh at Merton College. Like he was a, just a legend. He had amazing eyebrows, but that wasn't his defining feature. <laughs> he, <laughs> Sounds uh, like it was. <laughs> Expert in combinatorics and not theory and probability, but also like had been around. Like he knew Professor Tolkien, um, you know the guy that wrote the book, the Lord of the Rings book. So yeah. at Merton College, which is where Tolkien was yeah. as a professor, Dominic Welsh had been there briefly, overlapping with him, and you know things like that uh, were just great. I feel lucky to have gone to places where that sort of thing happened. But he was also a great tutor and a very human tutor, and. He bucked the trend, which was around me at Oxford, of this super academic pressure. Dominic was, you know, trying to make me work and do a decent mm. degree, but also would chat about normal stuff and under- engage with me as a human being. And I am very grateful to him for that. Yeah. And then during my PGC, Anne Watson, who I'm still in touch with now in the maths education, and she's recently joined Twitter and puts her opinions out there. Mm. She she wrote lots of stuff about maths education, but she was also a really good course tutor on my PGC and made me think about maths and about how students learn maths in a new way. Complete, it kind of changed my worldview that year. Maybe it dragged it more idealistically left wing than uh, it should have done. But you know, you've got to be dragged towards extremes in order to balance out, right? I feel like just for the sort of the sake of the thread of the podcast, we should quickly touch base with your grumpy twin and find out what he's <laughs> up to at the moment. Tim had gone to Cardiff. He'd gone to Cardiff and studied what, something musical or? No, he did engineering. Right. Actually, so did an environmental engineering degree. He was determined not to go to Oxford or Cambridge. Like th- this is part of the reaction I talked about earlier. We're, like, if we saw each other doing things, we would diverge. I, I, I can't do that. That's what Tim does. Or, okay. I can't do that. That's what Ben does. So, and he was really resistant, a little bit like I was, to the idea of going somewhere with a prestigious name like Oxford or Cambridge. And he didn't even apply, although almost certainly could have got some offers. Yeah. He was really anti that idea, and I sympathise with that. He went off to Cardiff and did a degree and realised that the engineering degree at Cardiff was a bit of a hodgepodge of ideas. It didn't really fit engineering. It didn't really fit environmental science. Right. But as a result, he also, maybe there's a theme here, uh, he didn't pay a lot of attention to his degree and did lots of music. Yeah. But his was playing guitar and singing on the open mic scene, had a little band going. I actually went, I remember going across to Cardiff to do a gig with Tim. I think we, we called ourselves... There were two other guys. We had a band called Short Straw, which isn't a great name, but it's not terrible. It's all it right. was it's all right. it was slightly ruined by the fact that on our gig, I sort of decided I was going to wear a hat, and I had a, a sort of floppy fedora, which I'd come back from America with once. <laughs> on stage, I think it just looked a little bit like a farmer's hat, right. and then combined combined with Short Straw, and like everyone was like, "These are a bunch of sort of Dorset yokels trying to sing." <laughs> So he did music stuff and ended up... Uh, <laughs> Short straw didn't take off, though. They've, uh, they've, they've retired now. Not for want of talent, but uh, just want of appreciation. Right. Uh, the, want of a decent hat. That's what it was, yeah. Tim did engineering, though, and yeah. as a result of not enjoying his course, decided not to do the fourth year, which is quite common on engineering degrees, mm. uh, and stopped. At which point they were like, oh, would well, you want to carry on anyway and do a PhD? I think they were interested in keeping him in there because he was probably doing well he just didn't really enjoy it anyway he decided to carry on because they were going to pay him to do a phd a graduate study thing yeah and uh, mainly though i think because he could stay on the open mic scene in cardiff so he stayed for another three years doing a phd and i think hated it but there was a conversation sort of 10 years later uh, where he was finishing off his phd i'd gone back to study at oxford again and we ended up talking on the phone and he said oh, what are you what are you studying today and I was like, oh, I'm trying to figure out Navier-Stokes equations and how they sort of relate to fluid dynamics. And yeah. and he went quiet. And then uh, and it's like, you realise I'm, re- I'm reading that exact page right now in my textbook as well. So we, <sighs> we'd come full circle. And that was one of those crazy twin moments of like, we're doing exactly the same thing. Ten years after diverging, we're back studying the same stuff. And just quickly, did Tim has Tim become an engineer? Does he work as an engineer now? Or? He works as a music teacher and a web designer and a general freelance odd body. All right jack of all trades let's go back to you though you've 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 finished this conversion this teacher conversion course yeah that's one year yeah what do you do next i got a job in dorset at the school i grew up in which is a dangerous thing yeah i didn't intend to go there it was one of those things during the pgc from about halfway through you start applying for jobs because you need a job and you know there's only one way to practice doing the application things and one of the first jobs i applied for because it came up at the time was a, a job at the school i used to go to Hmm. And I thought, well, that's a good way to practice it. And then I got offered the job and I was like, I, do, do I want it? And I think it's a sign of a a decent school experience that I even considered going back there. And I did decide to go back there. And I figured yeah. that 
that maybe that's a good place to learn my trade as a teacher in a place that has some familiarity without you know there's plenty to learn as a teacher so i did two years there i had a very good school experience myself but i still have like anxiety dreams that i'm back at my school that i was at as a kid like it's an uncomfortable dream and you've actually gone back there to work and i had to enter the staff room <laughs> as a teacher <laughs> what is interesting i think i'd left it just long enough that there were no pupils who were there still while i was a pupil i'd left it you know one generation through the school so yeah. that was good but there were quite a few teachers that were the same and that was a mixture of good and weird as hell. Yeah, God. I could do all sorts of teacher stories, but they're probably still functioning. So I should, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I should censor some of them. I like that you almost sounded a little bit boastful that you got to go in the staff room. <laughs> oh man, that was a crowd. I, my school particularly had a weird setup. Where if you wanted to see a teacher, you'd go and loiter near a little um, lobby near the staff room. Yeah. And there was these sort of holy steps which only teachers could walk up. And yeah. then they, you could see them turn left into the staff room and you never saw that. Yeah. Now, you know, there was occasional after school concerts and things where we'd, you know, roam the schools and investigate all the places we weren't allowed to see during school. So I had been in there as a as a sort of illicit visit. Yeah. As a as a pupil. I mean, who doesn't do that? There's ever a time you have to go into the staff room. Like I'd like you have permission. Can you please pass this note to Mr. Jones? He's in the staff yeah. room. And you get to go in. It is. It's like Absolutely. it's like the holy of holies, isn't it? You're like, I can't believe I'm getting to see this. This is amazing. And I think it was like a it was some Christmas concert and uh we were backstage if you like and everyone else is you know and, and you're waiting your turn to go on but you've got time to kill so we we're wandering darkened corridors and managed to break into the the teacher's corridor yeah i remember someone running down it in slightly panic and running into the photocopier because it was dark <laughs> <Just> this, <laughs> this crunch i don't know if it worked after that we... but now you're in the staff room for real like you have like yeah. all access pass having to call teachers by their name instead of sir or whatever but, um, yeah there's a few teachers where it was really hard to break that even after years of being away and a few and, and lots of teachers who became good friends despite having taught me yeah. they became colleague colleagues and friends and that, so and that, that's a good redemption process to go through to stop school just from being these teenage memories I, i'm glad i didn't stay there much longer i did two years there yeah but that was enough i think to uh, otherwise you, you can get institutionalized really easily yeah in schools more than many jobs um but particularly a school you were at as a kid you get so used to that way of working what took you away from the school? I remember the headmaster, even when I got the job, saying, um, look, if you're still here in two years, I'm going to be putting job applications in your pigeonhole. I don't think he was being nasty. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think he realised that early career, you should move on. And so I, I took that advice. But I think having done my PGC and two years of teaching, I began to realise that I really loved maths, like more so than I had when I was doing my degree. I, that right. was that was the, the change, like you said. It happened after my degree. Mm. So I decided to go back and study, if I could, while I still kind of recognised that I loved it. Right. So I applied for a, a master's course back at Oxford, mathematical modelling and scientific computing, a very applied maths course. But crucially, like you could apply for funding, right? So you could ask someone to pay you to go and study. <laughs> I like the sound of that. Yeah, yeah. So I did that for a year, and it was really hard. Actually, it was really, that was really interesting for me as a mathematician. I remembered what it felt like to do uni maths again. Yeah. And after a break, you get really rusty. School maths is one thing, but university level maths. I was working alongside lots of recent graduates who'd just done their degree and carrying straight on, and I was out of my depth. Yeah. And I remember going into lectures and getting angry, just really boiling rage inside. And I think at the time I was thinking, oh, these people can't teach. I know about teaching. I'm a teacher. And this lecture is just droning on in a right. monotone. So because you've done those few years teaching, you're actually starting to look at your lecturers through a different prism now. Yes. Although I don't think that was really what's going on. I, that's true. University teachers aren't necessarily employed to be good teachers. They're employed to research and teaching comes as a secondary. Some of them are amazing teachers and some of them are not. Yeah. I don't think many people would disagree with that. Yeah. But I recognised eventually after I came out of those lectures and calmed down a bit, that the anger is quite often a result of not understanding. Yeah. If you're used to understanding something or you want to understand something and someone's not making it clear, it's a really normal reaction to get quite irate about it. And then I, there was this bombshell moment of realising that's, that's how my students have felt over the last three years of teaching. If they don't get something, it's not a surprise that some of them kick off. And it's not necessarily behaviour issues, but like learning is hard work and hard work and frustrating work. And so it was a good reminder of what it feels like to learn difficult things. Mm. And that has uh, always stayed with me, I think. And every once in a while, learning is something difficult yourself and remembering the emotional reaction yeah. to it is pretty useful as a teacher and as a speaker and communicator. It must help help you when you're making a number file video with me and you see that confused look on my face. Oh, does it ever leave your face? <laughs> 
one, it, uh, <laughs> so one year, one year at Oxford. Is that right? Doing this master's? Yeah. So I and this was the third visit to Oxford. So I'd done my three year degree. Yeah. I taught for a year. Went back and did a PGC at Oxford. In fact, although it felt very different. Okay. And then two years away teaching, and then back right. uh, for this master's year, and finished that year in mid September. It was a full year instead of a sort of an academic year. I had yeah. to do a thesis and things, and so it was too late to start teaching again, which was kind of a relief actually, because it meant I had a sort of almost sanctioned gap, and I hadn't had a gap year at any point in my life. So I decided to go travelling for the rest of that year yeah. with a guitar. Went off around the world. Yeah, I did, I literally did a round the world circuit, carrying a little busking guitar with me. And what you would busk, just go and earn money by playing in the streets, would you? Yeah, I mean, I didn't earn a lot of money. Yeah. I didn't cover my costs. I offset my costs. Okay. <laughs> Did you have the hat with you? No. Um, although the hat had become a bit of a thing, it was just one of those, like, it was a bit of extra <laughs> unnecessary baggage right. to carry on around the world trip when, you know, baggage is at a premium. So yeah. I'd already decided to buy a small busking guitar that was carrying with me all the time, and the hat couldn't fit. But metaphorically, the hat was out on the street every time I stopped and put my guitar case down. I was thinking, it really should have been the hat. Should have had the hat. The hat would, could have made the difference. Where did you go <laughs> in the travels? Like, you know, you don't have to give me the full itinerary, but what kind of parts of the world did you find yourself in? Well, I did kind of did an English speaking circuit, but, you know, so I started in San Francisco, worked up the West Coast to Vancouver, into Canada, New Zealand for two months, actually. I spent a long time in New Zealand, a month in Australia, and then Singapore and South Africa, and then home. Did you go to Adelaide? I did not. Oh, really. Rundle Mall is a great place for busking. You you would have covered your costs if you'd gone there. Uh, Melbourne was pretty good as well. Yeah, um, Melbourne Melbourne is a good place to busking. I had, I had some good. I've still never been to Adelaide. I, you know, one of these times, if we overlap in Australia, you have to show me around Adelaide. All right. Yeah, you you do you do have to go there. So during these busking, you know, your travelling busking period. Yeah. Does mathematics play any role in your life whatsoever at this point, or is this it's, <laughs> it's just it's just part for now? Now you're just like seeing the world and. It's about the music. Yeah, it only plays a part in my chat-up lines to people I meet. Right. <laughs> Mathematician, right, yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not completely kidding. It did function. It, like, it's, it becomes a topic of conversation rather than my job. Um, and I, I was a... Yeah. I was focusing more on music. I guess when you're busking in the street asking for coins, you really need to do something to get your cred up a bit. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. I mean, busking mathematicians don't have an, uh, as easy a time as singing a crowded house song in Australia. Yeah, yeah. I I, what, I remember I travelled all the way around the world with my bag all the time with a little headset, a microphone headset, in, ca- in case I needed to log back in to do some online teaching, which was another bit of income. I used to do some online teaching and some teacher training on the side. And so occasionally, I had I think I did two sessions while I was travelling. I logged in from Australia or something yeah. to, to do an online session back in the UK. Yeah. Keep, my, keep my hand in. Bit of tutoring from the road. Nice. <laughs> All right, so you've you've devoted some time to travels and music. You've got to end this bohemian lifestyle at some point. <laughs> what happens? What happens? Really? Do I have to? Well, I don't know. Maybe you don't. What happens next? <laughs> I I did about five months traveling. Yeah. Yeah. So I hadn't figured out what I wanted to do. I'd obviously done some teaching. I'd done some studying, and I'd done some traveling. And it's like, what do I do when I have to sort of settle a bit? Mm. I didn't really want to go back into full time teaching because the, I'd started doing some other projects on the side. I'd, so I'd. Uh, that that year, I'd set myself up as a sole trader or declared myself as a self-employed person for in order to take some jobs like tutoring um, yeah. and the occasional talk, which I'd started doing even while I was teaching. Still, someone said, "Oh, can you come and do a, a talk to this event with like a hundred teenagers?" So it was the first time I started doing talks, and I was aware that I enjoyed that. It kind of ticked all my performance mixed with education sort of yeah. leanings, and I'd begun to wonder if I could make that a job. It turns out. I couldn't, uh, but the process of declaring myself as a self-employed sole trader in order to be have a sort of legitimate way to take those opportunities if they turned up yeah. was helpful. So I spent the rest of that year tutoring, one-on-one GCSE A-level tutoring, and marking exams, which is extremely difficult and very sobering to realise some human, some poor human has to mark every script that students write. And you know, that, that's a really good insight into how to teach people to pass exams. In the end, the examiner is a human being yeah. who's bored out of their brain and if you make life hard for them by writing illegibly or something it ain't gonna help those sort of realizations only come when you mark the things yeah but did you take marking exams then as like is it a really big responsibility to you or do you become blasé about it like i'm fascinated to see behind that curtain yeah that uh, was a curtain i hadn't seen behind even as a teacher so you're preparing all these kids and then so i had this year of doing bits and pieces all right this is a good way to keep my hand in and um i remember i asked at Excel, 
the one of the examples. So like I can mark some some core maths, some sort of basic A level maths, and they're like, it's fine. No, we've got enough markers for that. Why don't you do uh, some advanced statistics? And I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and then realised that I I hadn't ever actually studied some of the things that I was having to mark. So things like hypothesis tests, uh, which absolutely fundamentally brilliant and important part of mathematics actually i'd never studied despite having done an a level in maths and further maths and a degree in maths i'd kind of dodged all those bits because i didn't enjoy it yeah and there's a stereotype about people not enjoying stats i think that's wrong it's desperately important it can be frustrating but i had to learn it from scratch before i could mark the thing yeah. so it was a mixture i was kind of a bit blasé and i don't think i was the most qualified to mark it but i could learn it and i knew i could learn it in time to be good enough to mark the thing and it was a serious responsibility. Marking exams is not fun and it is boring and you're on repeat and your brain's going to mush and all the time reminding yourself that someone's future depends on whether you put a one or a zero in that little box there. Yeah. So it's a, it's a weird feeling, mm. but it becomes um, like a production line. So you've got to stay sane somehow. Yeah. I'd be very careful about agreeing to do it, but I think all teachers should do it once at least just to see what it feels like. Yeah, yeah. So what happens now? That year of traveling with tutoring and examining made me realize that, you know, I liked this sort of slightly smorgasbord employment thing, but it wasn't very stable. Yeah. And so sooner after I came back, as, I'm going off into story mode, but as long as you're happy with it. <laughs> well, yeah. I came back and I had long hair, a big ponytail and big beard and was used to sort of swanning around South Africa rather than England. This was probably now March of that year and someone was organizing a maths event with lots of speakers coming and sort of 300 kids, um, year 10 or 11 or 12 kids. Joe, who was organising it, asked me, oh, do you come, come along and support and just, you know, see what's going on? And I, I turned up ready to do a bit of sort of magic trick stuff in the intervals, yeah. just because that was fun. And one of the speakers got stuck in snow. There was a weird snowfall that year and, and he was coming from up north and he couldn't make it. So we had this hour long slot with the speaker and it was 10 minutes to go and he wasn't there. And Joe was like, oh, what? We, need, we need to put someone up on stage. And I was like, well, I can go and fill some time mm. and i had a, a usb stick it was the time when nothing was in the cloud back then so i had a usb stick which happened to have a few bits and pieces in fact it was the stuff that i've done for you on number file on the mandelbrot set it was an old version of that dynamic geometry file where you move points around complex numbers yeah, yeah. without any warning i just turned up plugged this thing into a computer got the projector working and did a did I think 20 minutes off the cuff. Yeah. It was one of those things that you can't end up looking bad at that point. If, if you're at all okay in front of this audience, everybody knows you're stepping in, you haven't had time to prepare, so everyone's sort of sympathetic already. Yeah. And if you do a good job, they're like impressed. If you do a really good job, they are exponentially more impressed, more than you deserve. Yeah. And I think that's what happened. Everyone loved it. It was nice pictures, it was moving mass. Oh, yeah. It's a great talk. I was relaxed. Great number file video, people. Make sure you check it out. It's, it's one of those number file videos that I'm very pleased is on the record because I love that bit of maths and I've been I've been doing that for a long time yeah. and it's a nice story to tell people but what happened is basically there's lots of kids who I'm entertaining that's kind of what I'm doing it for yeah. but there were also lots of maths teachers in the room uh, who had I don't know jobs coming up so at the end of that day five job offers saying oh why don't you apply to come and work at a school because obviously I get announced on stage oh Ben's just back from traveling yeah. was a maths teacher and he's going to tell you about this. Were they more just trying to justify that huge beard and bushy hair do? But... Yeah, I was rocking it. I, was. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, I remember there was basically a queue of people saying, would you, we've got a vacancy, come and talk. So I ended up talking to a few schools after that. I felt really lucky, outrageously lucky to sort of land in the right place at the right time. So this was just being invited to come and give like, you know, one-off special presentations, not to come and be their new maths teacher. No, this was people saying, would you, will you come and teach? Because maths teacher jobs are everyone's desperate for mass teachers right. so you're spotting an unemployed mass teacher who's not offensive or uh, criminal basically <laughs> is licensed to go and queue up and say yeah please apply for a job okay. and it's still we've got a huge problem in the country of shortage of mass teachers yeah so i think what happened is they spotted someone who clearly was qualified as a mass teacher yeah. had some stage charisma and everyone's like let's get him yeah yeah so i ended up to cut a long story short working at a posh private boarding school which is not really my field of comfort but they I went. I applied for a job there as a maths teacher because they asked me to. I went and looked around and thought, I don't really fit in here. Certainly my hair doesn't fit in here. <laughs> or at least that's what Deputy Head told me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, you realise you're going to have to cut your hair if you work in. Yeah. At the end of the day, I, I'd had five interviews with various staff and thought, oh, it's all very pretty and exclusive, but I don't really fit. Hmm. And the last interview was with the head, and he said, it's uh, it's obvious, Ben, that you don't want this job, hmm. which, which is a bit of a facer. <laughs> you're like, well, is it that obvious? Yeah. And he said, it's all right, we don't really want to give you that job, which is also a bit of a sobering 
start to an interview. Yeah. But he said, what we'd like to do is recognize that you're doing lots of other stuff on the side. Why don't we give you a half-time job uh, as a, in a pastoral role, which you're clearly good at in the boarding school environment. We'll give you some teaching with it, but give, leave you plenty of time to explore your freelance options, speaking and tutoring as well. I hadn't really considered that as an option. I wasn't really sure how you go and ask a school for that sort of option. But credit to the guy, he kind of spotted something which really made me interested. It's like, I yeah. can go back to teaching. They clearly wanted to offer you the job but knew you didn't want it. So he's like, he played you like a cheap guitar. He played me and it worked. And I, you know, it wasn't just a benefit for them. There was a pretty good outcome for me. Yeah. So I worked for five years in that school, half time. But then working half time in a boarding school is a, is a bit of a joke. Yeah. yeah. I lived there. And for three of those years, I lived in a boarding house and was as close to a father figure for some of those kids as they had during term time. And that's worrying for all concerned. Yeah. We're almost up to date. So I did five years of that and developed my freelance work on the side and was increasingly doing maths talks and other bits of freelance business. I really enjoy the flexibility of having a bit of my life which is under my control as a freelancer. And so after five years, it was probably time to move on. And I had been working with the Advanced Maths Support Program, who they used to be called the FMSP, they're now the AMSP. Mm. They had employed me for a bit of my time while I was teaching down in Dorset and said, instead of paying you piecemeal for these talks, can we pay you a second you a tiny bit from your job what's this what's this group ben this is an organization that provides what talks and extra math teaching is it like originally they were set up to provide teaching they're called the further math support program because people who wanted to study further maths as an a level sometimes couldn't access it at their school mm. so originally about 15 years ago they were set up to provide some teaching for kids who couldn't access it at their school yeah. sometimes remote teaching online and sometimes by a tutor who would pop into their school yeah. that very quickly developed the government realized this is they needed to support maths education because there's a huge shortage of qualified mathematicians and maths teachers mm. so they put money into this project and it became about encouraging maths and supporting maths education in general right. so partly teaching the subjects people can access but also training teachers that's a big part of it and also doing enrichment to inspire people yeah. to make the choices later on and that's the bit those two bits are what I fell into, doing some teacher training and some enrichment stuff. So you'd go, maybe you'd go and you'd, sometimes you'd go and inspire teachers. Sometimes you'd go in front of a group of a few hundred students and just like, you know, exactly. wow them for half an hour and make them think, oh, maths is cool. Yeah, uh, certainly if you can do that. Mm. I mean, you can try and do that and it sometimes doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, it, it's important in any subject to remember why it's worth doing, even if the exams were cancelled, which is a very interesting observation right now when the exams have just been cancelled in this country and suddenly everyone's noticing, oh, but, you know, what is worth doing even if the exams are off? Mm. And they're realising that, that studying maths in order to progress to the next stage or because it's interesting is a valid option or it's much more obviously a valid option yeah. again. So while you're at the college for five years, you're doing yeah. a bit of work for this organisation on the side. Like they're, they're basically engaging you as a freelancer to go and do talks. Yeah, they actually, they kind of bought my time out of the school. So I ended up being fully employed by the school, but this company paid for a chunk of that time. Okay. And what happened is that they were interested in connecting more with universities. That overlap from school to university is a difficult one for kids and teachers to know how to support it. It's difficult for universities as well, because they don't really know what school feels like. Mm. And so the AMSP said, we should have a connection with the university. And they approached Bath. They had already had lots of connections with the university, but the University of Bath was also thinking, we need someone who knows about schools. And so that little marriage was like, who could fit this role? And I was like, I'll do that, put my hand up. And so I moved from Dorset to Bath and stopped the teaching half of my job, really, but kept the AMSP half of my job. Yeah. So I ended up employed by the University of Bath, but the money comes from the AMSP and that's half a job. And I go and do teach training and enrichment for them. And that meant that the other half of my time is now completely unaccounted for. And so I'm freelance for the rest of my time. Right. And that's kind of been the case for the last uh, six years. So half your time's what's it called? ASMP? A <laughs> the A Advanced Maths Support Program. So half your time is AMSP. Yeah. And half your time is whatever you choose. And that can be all sorts of different things. Yeah, loosely. There's some complications in there as well. But wow. yes. So tell me about that other half for a second. I know occasionally you do number five videos, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> That's the part I know about. What else do you do with this huge wedge of time that is yours to be creative with and earn money with? What's confusing is a lot of it ends up being very similar work to what I'm employed to do with the AMSP. So if a school approaches me, oh, can you come and do us a talk? I need to check whether that's part of my job with the AMSP. Right. Or, and if it's not for any reason or I've done my hours or whatever, then 
that I could do that as a freelancer yeah. and, and invoice them. Yeah. That, that was a big shock, actually. Moving from a teaching in world to having to charge people for your time yeah. is a strange shift. But no one teaches, I think, no one teaches to earn a lot of money. It's not super well paid. It's a decent wage, but it's not It's not a very mercenary job. You do it for the love of it and it's hard work. Yeah. Whereas suddenly having shifting to do the same sort of thing, but to give people a bill that was a bit of a shock so it takes a long time to get used to that way of working your adventure so far sounds very it sounds like very piecemeal and very like it's not yeah. very typical <laughs> have you been satisfied are you satisfied with it like has it made you happy has it been what you expected has it been like how do you feel about it when you when you tell the story of it now like this it is nice to reflect on it i think everyone reflecting on their stories has sort of weird moments of like did i follow the right path but i don't feel dissatisfied i certainly appreciate the flexibility that my job has now mm. you have to sacrifice something in terms of stability for that it's interesting though you set this up nicely talking about tim earlier on has maybe realized that the parallels are interesting now because my brother is doing a very piecemeal job he's doing sort of four or five different bits that he can flip between and some of them are freelance and some of them are employed mm. and that's very similar to my what do they call it, a portfolio career. But what it gives us both is flexibility, and we're clearly drawn to that. Mm. Uh, possibly we don't like being told what to do, or at least having the option to yeah. revert to a situation where we're not told what to yeah. do. So I'm, I'm glad about that, and I recognise that a twin brother who has the genetic experiment of doing the same thing as me, or different things with the same starting point, has ended up in a similar role. Yeah. So maybe we're always going to go that way. I guess your main your main job now then when you really boil it down yeah. is getting up in front of a group of people and talking yeah. to them about mathematics talking maths in public talking maths in public yeah which uh i'm using that phrase as an acronym sort of deliberately in my head with capital letters and I, you know about this because we there was a group of us who organized a sort of company we're now a charity actually called talking maths in public mm. and we're running a, a sort of conference every couple of years for people who do this slightly weird niche job which is yeah. stand up in front of people and talk about maths it's not different really from a teaching job in that it has that educational aspect but it has a much more of a performance side to it maybe that's why i'm happy doing it because i i love that slightly egotistical performance thing and maybe i say it like it's a bad thing but i even when i'm doing music i, I really enjoy and all performers do i think the enjoy feeling of doing something well and seeing other people having a good time because of it that's very obvious in music if you get it right at a gig and you sing a song or something that and you just see people enjoying themselves that's a huge payback which is why musicians do it not for a lot of money perhaps but um yeah performing a mathematics talk can give me the same sort of rush and, and, and yeah occasionally i will play music in a mathematics talk but uh, only if i can shoehorn it in i know there's a million ways to answer this question and you and you could do a whole course on the answer to this question so please hmm. don't but but what do you think the secret is to successfully talking maths in public? Like if you were going to just cherry pick one or two little nuggets for people who might be listening who are math teachers or, or are just curious about what makes people good at it. Can you think of like a little piece of advice or something that, that you think works that not everyone necessarily thinks of? I mean, the stereotype of maths being hard and sort of academic is, is something you can't ignore. So if you play into that too much and blind people with science, it's going to absolutely not help you. So I guess my one obvious go-to advice, which I have to tell myself regularly, is motivation. If you can find a way to motivate people to learn further, a lot of the work is done. And that might be some showing them something surprising, showing them something interesting or pretty or cool or, or curious. And then you've got sort of the fuel which is necessary to go and study the, the, sort of de the detail. Why is that fuel? Just because if something fascinates you, you just naturally want to know more about how it was built sort of thing. Yeah, I don't think any human does anything without some sort of motivation. And it can be a carrot and the stick business. It, it, it can be someone threatening you, like if you don't do this, you, you won't have enough money. Or if you don't do this, I'm going to threaten you. Or do this because the carrot is dangled in front of you and you're like i want that so i guess nobody would like to think that people only do stuff because you threaten them to it seems like a inefficient way of doing something mm. and if you can show them the carrot dangling and say ah that pretty picture like take the mandelbrot set like look at that what is that and why does it happen is a lot of fuel for studying some difficult concepts there are only certain people that will be motivated by that though won't there like if you, if oh, you oh that's true yeah. yeah like if you show someone if you show someone the mandelbrot set i think there's a certain subset of people that will go, that's beautiful and fascinating. I want to know more. But I can think of yeah. a lot of people in my life who would look at that and just like, it would just, they'd go, mm, what? That's just what a mess. People's tastes are different, right? And 
I think as a teacher particularly, that's in a classroom of people, you've got 30 kids and they all have different tastes and leanings. But if you don't show them a range of things, then the chance that some of them get turned on by that little image or something will be lost. I mean, I'm not claiming that everybody will get a massive rush out of everything I show everyone. Mm. And it's like music. Everyone has different tastes. You go to a gig and some people love it and some people are like, meh. That's not done in order for them to study further. That's just imparting pleasure. But you, you don't impart the same pleasure to everyone all the yeah. time. I do think it's true, though, that nobody does anything without motivation. And whether you are concealing the motivation or haven't noticed it consciously, it's true of whatever we do. Like, you know, you want to go and cook food, it's because you're hungry, partly. And so education is a bit like that. If you If you want to get through an idea to someone, you've got to show them, even unconsciously, a reason to do it. I've seen you give a few talks, and obviously I filmed you making a number of our videos, and I can see, you know the tricks you use and the inspiration you use and you obviously use humor a lot very cleverly as well so <laughs> and like you're obviously very good at that the thing i want to ask you though is about talking to a group of mathematics teachers because i do talks as well and i quite enjoy doing talks yeah there's nothing i find harder than talking to a room full of mathematics teachers <laughs> like that is that is yeah, yeah. a completely different beast the, uh, the stereotypes really kick in at that point. I mean, in any audience, you're going to have people who pick you up on details, but maths teachers are wor the worst. The the stereotype of us being pedants and like, oh, you spelled that wrong. Again, oh, the apostrophe is in the wrong place, even if it's not maths pedantry. So I, I think they're a frightening audience. But they're also, they're, their motivation is very different to other audiences, I find. They don't, they, yeah. they're like, you can keep your math tricks till the cows come home. That's not going to help me in my job. And the, and the reason I'm here is because I need help in my job. Right. And uh, this is true of a lot of teachers. Teaching is hard. And so we're well, back to our carrot and stick metaphor. Just, just survival as a teacher becomes your overriding motivation. Yeah. And how, however much you love your subject, what's going to get you through the next period with the year nines on a Friday afternoon is more important because yeah. basically it feels like your world's going to end. So, I, yeah, I mean, I remember feeling like that as a teacher. Yeah. You stop paying attention to maybe the bits of your subject which should get you excited and you should be able to show people and you start occasionally getting blinkered into i just need to get through this and i need to find a decent assessment tool that helps me get through this and mm. reduces the amount of blooming paperwork mass teachers in general are harder when it's because they're doing a difficult job and yeah. it's it's hard to get through the motivation sort of blinkers in the right context if you can get through that suddenly you can provide other motivation and i know a lot of mass teachers who are insanely grateful the number file exists so fair play to you because you're providing an easy accessible way of seeing little nuggets of of motivation that aren't exam focused and that's a really good thing what do you want to be doing next then you you seem to have this be tumbling from one one thing to the next like is there have you got like this end game or grand thing or you really have is is what you're doing now good for now no uh any suggestions wow I don't know. I think you could always do more number file videos. I'm totally in favour of that. I'd, I'd like to do that. <laughs> I I am happier now. I feel a bit guilty that I'm not teaching in a classroom, but I, I feel like I, someone has to do uh, these bits that are slightly outside the classroom. And I, I'm really glad to be in this situation now. I don't know how long it will last. And freelance work is always a bit like, how long is this little niche going to actually employ me yeah. but i feel like there are a lot of options and things will change i have no doubt in the future even during i mean we're recording this in sort of lockdown state and so everyone's been stuck at home a lot longer mm. but i've as a result dug out an old midi piano and recording studio bit set up and i'm trying to like maybe resurrect a bit more music which was a big part of my life for a long time and i haven't done a lot of recently mm. so i don't think i'm ever going to make a my way as a paying musician uh, or a paid musician but there are lots of bits of things that i enjoy doing that i've had a chance recently that to maybe tinker with again yeah if you've ever if anyone else listening has ever seen a number file video from me you realize that i spend a lot of my time tinkering on bits of software as well like there's one called geogebra where you can make maths move and i spend a lot of my time tinkering with that and so there's there's options there to sort of do less presentation maybe in the future and more work on making resources that that make maths move and look exciting I mean, there's lots of other people doing that really well yeah. as well. Yeah. There's a few options out there. We'll see. Are you still doing any one-on-one -on -one tutoring? Not personally. Uh. The AMSP, who I still work for in a sort of floating role as doing enrichment, particularly during lockdown, has had to change how it supports students. So I can see that might actually start happening again, maybe online, doing some tutoring to small groups and things. But right now, no, I'm not doing any tutoring. I don't have time to, uh, to make it happen. And finally... You mentioned we're in lockdown. Are you having a lot of contact with Tim at the moment? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we speak regularly. Uh, he's got a five-year-old son called William. 
who uh, I need to catch up with from time to yeah. time. But to be honest, one of the main things Tim and I do is every every Sunday night we have uh, we we both log on to Steam and play play games together. We we start with a, a sort of audio call yeah. headset and then play some stupid online games together. And that's our that's our twin bonding time at the moment. What do you play? All sorts of things. Usually really old games. Yeah. There's one called Soldat. I think it's a Scandinavian thing where you're sort of stupid side running around either cooperative or and you're shooting people. Yeah. Like these are these are not sort of high level thinking games. These are these are fun bits of time with a with your Oh brother. no, I know the number file audience. If I don't find out what games you're playing, there'll be like a riot. I used to spend a lot of time playing XCOM, uh, which is sort of turn based strategy thing. But when playing with other people, it's a really different thing. And I enjoy playing games on my own, but they're usually sort of much slower paced. And people playing with me would be like seriously bored. Nah. So it's much more arcadey stuff when uh, when I'm joining with other people. Well, in the notes for this show, people, I will be linking to most importantly Ben's website, and you can get in touch with him. Uh, you can see all sorts of things he's up to. You, very importantly, you can book him in for a talk or something when all this lockdown shenanigans ends, Indeed. and get him to come out because Ben's talks are excellent. Oh, I've seen a couple, and they're they're definitely worth worth your time thanks Brady and I also will link to some of Tim's music so you can check out what he's up to as well I mean one of these days I need to record some music myself but um, that I think well I did have an idea actually because I do use little bits of interlude music just to break the interview up and at the start and the end and I do have like number five music you could do your rendition of the number five music and I'll use that as all the little stings and ends and things like that it could be you playing and I'll, I'll tell people that at the end as a surprise <laughs> Okay, I'll have a try. I, I'm not going to promise anything. My uh, my musical skills all, almost always ended up being I wanted to sing, which is always very difficult to do as a background thing. And so my uh, my guitar skills are basically background accompaniment, and anything which is just guitar always makes me feel like I really really should have actually you know learned to play this properly. <laughs> So as uh, Ben plays us out on the guitar, my thanks to him and to his twin, Tim, who was unwittingly dragged into this episode. There are links to everything we discussed today and Ben's website, of course, in the video description. I'll also link to Ben's number file videos. Number file is supported by the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute in Berkeley, California. It's also made possible by support from people like you, listeners and viewers, via small contributions on Patreon. If you'd like to help us out, it really makes a difference. Even like a dollar a month goes a long way. Go to patreon.com slash number file. Thanks to those of you who already support us. Your names are all listed on our wall of fame. I'll link to that as well in the description. I'm Brady Harron. We'll be back again very soon with another podcast. <laughs>